Thank you, Lucas. Praise God. Isn't it great to be together this morning on this beautiful day? I think we need to stand up and greet those around us and thank God for one another. I thank God. I thank God. Every day. I thank God. And we need you as well, always. Wonderful to be a part of the family of God. Are there announcements? Um, first of all, are there visitors this morning that anyone would like to introduce? It's Judy and Lou here. You're not exactly visitors, but welcome this morning. Dennis and Phyllis. Dennis and Phyllis. I feel like sort of like you're a part of us too, so welcome this morning. Okay, now we're ready for announcements. Anyone have announcements to make today? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Lucas. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Wow, I got two people on that. <laughs> So if all the time, God is good. then God is obviously good. Well, speaking of being blessed, I've been blessed with another opportunity to uh, lead you with some uh, music this morning, for better or worse. So if you'd like to uh, stand and join me and uh, sing praise to God.
Christian is growing. The tide is coming in. Here it is. Here. Here is our King. Here is our love. Here is our God who's come to bring us back to Him. He is the one. He is Jesus. Do that again. Here's our King. Here is our King. Here is our love. Here is our God who's come to bring us back to Him. He is the one. He is Jesus. And what was said? And what was said to, to the rose to make it unfold? What was said? said to me here in my chest to be quiet now and rest the ocean the ocean is growing the tide the tide is coming in here it is here here is our king here is our love here is our God who's come to bring us back to Him. He is the one. He is Jesus. Do that again. Here. Here is our King. Here is our love. Here is our God who's come to bring us back to Him. He is the one. He is Jesus. Majesty. come to bring us back to him he is the one he is jesus again here here is our king here is our love here is our god who's come to bring us back to him he is the one he is jesus majesty one more time some okay this next one is uh, Jesus Messiah anyone ever heard of that one it's been around a little while maybe maybe a little more familiar than that that first one is David Crowder <laughs>
Lord of all. His body the bread. His body the bread. His blood the wine. Broken and poured out. All for love. The whole earth trembled. And veil was torn. Love so amazing. Love so amazing. Jesus. Jesus Messiah. Name above all names. Blessing Redeemer. Emmanuel. Rescue. The rescue for sinners. The ransom from heaven. Jesus Messiah. is in you. All our hope is in you. All our hope is in you. On the glory to you, God. The light of the world. Jesus. Jesus Messiah. Name above all names. Blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all, Jesus Messiah, right at the end, Jesus Messiah. Lord of all. Amen. Okay. <laughs> call to worship this morning is Psalm 25, if you'd like to follow along as I read it. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. In you I trust, O my God. Do not let me put, be put to shame, nor my enemies triumph over me. No one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame, but they will be put to shame who are treacherous without excuse. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are my God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, O Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you are good, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful for those who keep the demands of his covenant. For the sake of your name, O Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. Who then is the man that fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way chosen for him. He will spend his days in prosperity, and his descendants will inherit the land. The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. My eyes are ever on the Lord, for only he will release my feet from the snare. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart have multiplied. Free me, free me from my anguish. Look upon my affliction and my distress and take away all my sins. See how my enemies have increased and how fiercely they hate me. Guard my life and rescue me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness protect me, because my hope is in you. Redeem Israel, O God, from all their troubles. Will you pray with me as we prepare to receive the morning offering? Dear Lord, we praise you and we thank you for being our hope and our redeemer. 
We praise you for the love that you shower down upon us in so many ways and so many times. We praise you just for being with us this morning and ask that you will open our hearts to you, to your presence, and to what you would speak to each one of us. We ask that you will bless our tithes and offerings as we give back to you a portion of what you shower upon us. And we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. You know why Lucas? You know why Lucas plays plays that piano? Or why he played that way? Is because he lives. <laughs> it took me a while to get the tune. That was beautiful, Lucas. Thank you. Let's uh, take our hymn books and respond to God's goodness by singing the first verse of Jesus. We just want to thank you. Hymn number 791. Let's remain standing as we sing our opening song, Glory to His Name, hymn 493. Safe from sin, Jesus so sweetly abides within. There at the cross where he took me in, glory to his name, glory to his name, glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to His name. Oh, precious fountain that saves from sin, I am so glad that I entered in. There Jesus saves me and keeps me clean. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Come to the fountain so rich and sweet. Cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Thank you. You may be seated. This last week I had... Uh, prayer and devotions at Dorothy Senior Citizen Center, which was really kind of sobering because that group used to be about 30 people, and now it's about 15, 12 people. Um, but I try to find something funny, something that might inspire them and get them to think a little bit, uh, along with myself, about reality and about God and truth and life. 
And I found this uh, devotion that I thought was appropriate. I'm going to use it for the children's message. It's, it's short. It's, it's, it's good. Uh, part of the rebuilding of New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina caused a challenge where residents had the task of tracing their home titles back hundreds of years to the original owner of the land. With the community rich with history stretching back over two centuries, houses have been passed along through generations of family, sometimes making it quite difficult to establish ownership. Here's a great letter from an attorney who wrote the FHA, the Federal Housing Administration, on behalf of a client. He was told the loan would be granted if he could prove satisfactory title to a parcel of property being offered as collateral. The title of the property dated back to 1803, which took the lawyer three months to track down. After sending the information to the FHA, he received the following reply. Upon review of your letter adjoining your client's application, we note the request of supported by an abstract of title. While we compliment the able manner in which you have prepared and presented the application, we must point out you have only cleared title to the proposed collateral property back to 1803. Before final approval can be accorded, it will be necessary to clear the title back to its origin. Hmm. Let's remember American history. Annoyed, the lawyer responded as follows. Your letter regarding title, case number 189156, has been received. I note you wish to have title extended further than 206 years covered by the present application. I was unaware any educated person in this country, particularly those working in the uh, working in the property area would not know Louisiana was purchased by the United States from France in 1803. The year of origin identified in our application. For the edification of uninformed FHA bureaucrats, the title to the land prior to U.S. ownership was obtained from France, which had acquired it by right of conquest from Spain. The land came into the possession of Spain by right of discovery by, in the year 1492 by a sea captain named Christopher Columbus, who had been granted the privilege of seeking a new route to India by the Spanish monarch, Queen Isabella. The good Queen Isabella, being a pious woman and almost as careful about titles as the FHA, took the precaution of securing the blessing of the Pope before she sold her jewels to finance Columbus's expedition. Now the Pope, as I'm sure you may know, is the emissary of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And God, it is commonly accepted, created this world. Therefore, I believe it is safe to presume God also made the part of the world called Louisiana. God, therefore, would be the owner of origin. And his origins date back before the beginning of time, the world as we know it, and the FHA. I hope you find God's original claim to be satisfactory. Now may we have our loan. The loan was immediately approved. <laughs> but what got me about this story uh, about ownership, you know, as I push it up against 60 years old and... Um, as we get older, one of, well, one of the things I've just realized is I'm just a renter. I'm just renting. My house will be sold after I'm gone. My junk will be gone and sold, hopefully. <laughs> the things that I have collected that were precious to me, my kids probably will not be interested in that. I'm just a renter because the original landowner has claim over it and me. And I think we need to think about that at times. We're just passing through. We're just renters. And this devotion reminded me of that. And I want to thank the Lord for that reminder. Let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn 329, There's Power in the Blood.
Let's rise up as we sing. 329, there's power in the blood. from your passion and pride there's power in the blood power in the blood come for a cleansing to Calvary's side there's wonderful power in the blood there is power power wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb there is power power wonder working power in the precious blood of the lamb would you be wider than wider than snow there's power in the blood power in the blood instead are lost in his life-giving flow there's wonderful power in the blood there is power power wonder working power in the blood of the lamb there is power power wonder working power in the precious blood of the lamb would you do service for jesus your king there's power in the blood power in the blood would you live daily his praises to sing there's wonderful power in the blood there is power power wonder working power in the blood of the lamb there is power power wonder working power in the precious blood of the lamb amen you may be seated If you'd like to take your scriptures and turn to Matthew 21, verses 20 through 32, or you can watch the uh, text on the screen, Mrs. Bear will read the text for us. Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was preaching, the chief priests and elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked, and who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or from men? They discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say from men, we are afraid of the people, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. <laughs> Then he said, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered, but later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first, they answered. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did, and even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. I was telling Jane, I think it was earlier this week, we were talking about this text. 
It's only taken me about hmm, 30 some years to understand this text. I'm, I'm finally beginning to think biblically. <laughs> I mean, it's just amazing how I can read things over and over and say, boy, I just don't get it. I got it this time. And uh, one of the things that makes you feel good is when you get it and you read scholars and commentators and you, they get it too. It helps you understand that at least you're thinking in some direction in the right way. Uh, before we start, I'd just like to ask the question, who, who has ever paid you lip service? Who's ever paid you lip service? My kids. Your kids? Okay. Children pay lip service? You know, you know, they say one thing and they don't follow through. Hmm. Hmm, they say one thing, they don't follow through. Who who else has, pays us lip service? Politicians. Politicians. <laughs> uh, we should say some politicians. There you go. Not all politicians, but some. Maybe maybe the majority. I'm not sure. <laughs> but some politicians. Anyone else pays lip service? So we're saying that man pays the lip service. Did God really do that? No, God doesn't pay lip service. God does what God promises to do and has done it through Christ. That's right. But I'm talking about who do we know in our relationships and in our life experience who's paid us lip service. Children, politicians. Bosses. What was that? Bosses. Spouse. Spouse? No. Is, is, that, is that person married who said that? <laughs> oh, okay. Sometimes our spouses pay us lip service. And, and sometimes do you? Yep. All right. Employees. Employees. Okay. Uh, sometimes, um, you know, we think about the religious world. Sometimes we Christians, sometimes we Christians pay lip service, don't we? Don't we? We say we follow Jesus, but yet we're not willing to forgive. We say we we say we're a follower of the servant, but we're not willing to serve the poor, the oppressed. You know, it's kind of funny in the Old Testament about taking the Lord's name in vain. Uh, Christians are the only people who can take the Lord's name in vain. Swearing is not taking the Lord's name in vain. Taking the Lord's name, Jesus Christ, Christian, and then not living the Christian life is taking the Lord's name in vain. It's paying lip service. And this is what I want to talk about today, because our culture is filled with lip service. I find myself at times paying lip service. At a recent show, uh, an elderly woman came into my, my space and wanted to buy something, and she was vibrant. She was very nice. And I said, you know, if I was 30 years older and single, I'd be chasing after you. And she goes, you are full of, and she, she didn't use Bible study. And I said, no, you meant Bible study, didn't you? But I was, I was just having fun with her. But in a way, I was paying her lip service. In today's story, we got people that pay lip service. You know, in the, uh, I want to talk about veneered veneration. Veneer furniture, it's not solid, it just has a, a coat, a skim of nice wood on top of usually cheap wood. And veneration means to respect, revere, or honor, or worship. Veneered veneration. Today when we write an email or document, we can bring attention to what we want to emphasize by bolding the print. If there's a word or a phrase that we want to highlight, we just bold it. We can make it stand out from the rest of the text to emphasize its importance. But back in the day, in the first century, when Jesus' stories were being collected and remembered and written down, they couldn't use bold type. The style they used to make something stand out was repetition. 
And today's text in Matthew 21 opens up the controversy about Jesus' authority with the religious power brokers of the temple in Jerusalem. And Matthew begins with this story of Jesus' authority being brought into question, and he records not one, not two, but three stories after this initial questioning of Jesus' authority by what he is doing in the temple and what he's teaching. There's the story of the two sons, which Jane just read about going to the vineyard. And then following that is about the renters of the vineyard, the tenants of the vineyard. And then it ends with the story of the wedding banquet, about who's invited and who shows up and who rejects the invitation. And all three of these stories are indictments against the shallow spiritual leadership found in the temple in Jerusalem at the time of Jesus. The corruption of the first century Judaism is well known. Ever since, oops, excuse me, I'm ahead of myself. Ever since the Maccabean revolt in 175 BC, the high priests that were elected to be the chief priests of the Jewish people was often given to the highest bidder. The Greeks. And then later, after the Romans conquered that area, the Romans. It wasn't about who had spiritual depth. It was about who had money. So blatant was the lip service given by God by the high priest, the Sanhedrin, and the elders of first century, actually before that, second, first century B.C., a hundred years before Jesus, a whole group of devout Jews saw the corruption of the religious power brokers in the temple and they withdrew to a little small corner of Jerusalem and they built their little enclave with high walls. And then they also went out in the desert and they built this place called Qumran. They were the Essenes. And they were the ones that copied the ancient texts and then hid them in clay jars and stuck them in cave number four. And we get the Dead Sea Scrolls. They pulled out of the temple and Judaism because they could see the corruption of it. You can see then why perhaps... Jesus would get upset with what was going on in the temple. To add injury to insult, at the time of Passover, the great high feast, remembering the deliverance of God for the Jewish people out of bondage in Egypt, across the wilderness, and into the promised land eventually. These Jews would come for hundreds and hundreds of miles in the known world around the Mediterranean basin to Jerusalem to offer their sacrifices to God. And they would often purchase their sacrifices, like out on the Mount of Olives, or in the streets of Jerusalem, and then they would go up to the temple to worship and praise God and offer their sacrifices. And once they got into the temple precincts, there were all these vendors who were selling dove and pigeon and lambs for sacrifice. And lo and behold, the vendors, excuse me, the priests would look at the sacrifices that were bought outside of the temple and say, oh, this dove has a hurt wing. You can't offer it to God. But you can buy one of these in the temple right here. Guess who got a percentage of all the vendors? The high priest. It was a scam. It was a business. It was about greed. The high priest was in the customer care industry, except he was fleecing the people of God. And of course, these, most of them very poor, Jewish pilgrims were forced by their religious convictions to take what little money they had left to buy the sacrifices in the temple precinct so they could offer it to the Lord God. The corruption in first century Judaism is unparalleled. To hold power in the temple 
only men who were trained by the Sanhedrin who sat in the in the what was called the chamber of hewn stone could teach and preach on the temple precincts once they went through years of training under the Sanhedrin the Supreme Court they laid hands on them and this gave this person the authority to teach and speak and make binding decisions in other words this is how you became a rabbi the chief, priest, the chief priests and elders' questions about Jesus' authority implies that Jesus did not go through the proper channels. He was not an accredited teacher. Not worthy of the temple. Jesus, however, did not play by their rules. He came to the temple, and here's the irony. Jesus comes to the temple, and the chief priests and the elders go to Jesus. The irony of that. He goes to the temple as an untrained hillbilly from the hills of Galilee. And he's there speaking and preaching and stirring up trouble for those who are in power. This is precisely why they question his authority. The word exousia in Greek means delegated authority. Who has delegated you this authority to preach and teach in the temple precincts? In fact, this question is so important that in the first four verses of our text today, the word exousia is used four times. By what authority? By what authority? Jesus says, by what authority did John come? Then he asks again, by what authority? By what authority? Jesus, Jesus uses the greatest of all smackdowns. Jesus replied, I will ask you one question. You know, if you want to follow Jesus, here's, here's a good reminder. Of all the questions Jesus is asked in the four Gospels, He only answers, I believe it's two of them directly, He always answers a question with a question. And perhaps we need to learn a lesson there that instead of us giving people our answer, we need to ask questions to make them go deeper and look inside themselves about God and about reality and truth. But Jesus replied here, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I'll tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or was it from men? And Jesus puts them in a quandary, a political quandary. Because if they answer that it was from heaven, then why in the world didn't you go out there and get baptized and repent and change the direction of understanding who we are as the people of God? Why didn't you do that if it's from heaven? And if it's from men, they were afraid that all the people who thought John was a prophet from God would turn on them and be angry with them and disgusted. So they didn't even discuss the question. They didn't even begin to think about the question Jesus asked. They asked among themselves and looked at what the cost and the benefit of their answer would be. Neither of which they were willing to face. Face Instead of seeking the truth by this question, these religious power brokers are scheming for the best political answer to save face. Here is the Son of God standing in the temple and asks this question. And they are so blinded by their tradition and so encapsulated by their hunger for power, they cannot take on the pain of asking the, the genuine question about John's baptism. And then Jesus goes right into the story about these two sons who are the offspring of a man who owns a vineyard and who asks him to go out and work. And often, as it is here, the vineyard is a symbol of God's people in the Old Testament. The vineyard is a symbol of God's people. And so, here's this story. These two sons were asked to go out and work among God's people.
Here's a quotation from Isaiah that lets you see how the vineyard symbol is used about the people of God. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel, and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed, for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. Jesus quotes this in an earlier chapter in Matthew. This Jesus has come to the people of God as the Son of God, this God that loves his people. And instead of finding justice, he finds bloodshed and manipulation and greed. And he's looking for righteousness, but what he hears is the distress and the cries of the poor who are being oppressed by religion and the religious leadership of that era. Jesus drives the point home. Some people responded to John's message, though they looked like they were rebels against God and His holiness. And others refused to listen to John and his message, though they appeared to be God's holy people and chosen ones. Yep, you guessed it. It's just like these two sons. One of whom said, nope, to his father, and then went and worked. While the other one said, with lip service, yes, I'll work, and then doesn't show up. And what is so ironic about this story is that the no group consists of the despised tax collectors and the immoral prostitutes. This is the group who initially responded to the father's request saying, no, I will not work in your vineyard. But then they changed their minds. Here's a great word in Greek, meganoite. Meganoite, let's say that. Meganoite. It's the word of repentance. It means to change one's thinking, to change one's mind, to change direction. This first group that said no repents and changes their minds. And they go out and are water baptized with John because they are ready for the new thing that God is doing. And it's through Jesus. And what we find here is that these are the ones who listened. They believed in John's message. They changed their thinking. They repented. For Jesus, what counts is right conduct which flows out of a changed heart and a changed mind about God. These previously held nobodies who responded to John's message of repentance are entering the kingdom ahead of the chief priests and the elders. It's kind of interesting. The Greek word there, according to one scholar, is they are leading you. They are ahead of you. They're going to lead you into the kingdom. So the ones who were viewed upon as unrighteous, unholy, unacceptable are the ones who are leading the super good looking righteous people who are paying lip service to God. The group who said no becomes the yes group. The second son in the story represents the yes group who said they would work, but then they didn't even show up in the vineyard. The second son who says yes but really means no symbolizes the corrupt chief priests and the elders who are given charge to care for God's people. The chief priests and elders have all the right affirming words, but there is no action. There is no servanthood. There is no love. There is no compassion. There is no empathy. There is no justice. There is no change of direction. There is no repentance. There is no lasting fruit. And these spiritual leaders who are called to be filled with the Spirit of God and truth are revealed as charlatans. They appear to have said yes to God. Oh yeah, I'll work in the vineyard. I'll work among and for God's people. 
but their actions betray them. They are only offering God lip service. They are only offering God veneered veneration. And the word of the prophet Isaiah shouts at us again, These people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Jesus himself quotes this exact passage that comes from the prophet Isaiah as an indictment against your right, against these same people, the chief priests and the elders who are hiding behind religion, covering up their greed and their corruption and their lust for power behind the veil of obedience to God. Well, Christians do this too. Can I say something that's probably going to be controversial at some level? I don't do business with people who have an ichthus on their sign. One of the symbols of early Christianity because I have been bitten more by those people than people who don't claim Christ. There is this temptation because we are religious or call ourselves Christian that we can play games. This is exactly what Jesus is indicting. They come close. They say the right things. But their hearts are a thousand miles away from my heart. One of the most humbling texts is when Paul writes, I believe it's in Galatians, God will not be mocked. And Jesus drives the point home deeper in the spiritual coffin. Saying, you did not believe him even after you saw this. You did not repent and believe in John. This second son who said, yes, I'll go and doesn't show up, only pays lip service to John's message. They neither believed John nor repented bearing fruit in keeping with repentance. They chose not to change direction and continued in their self-destruction and their self-destructive thoughts and national zeal which would end with the collapse of Israel, the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70 because they would not be Israel like Jesus was Israel. One who turned the other cheek, went the extra mile, gave his cloak away. They would not be peacemakers. They would rebel and they would get squashed. And he warned them and warned them and warned them and asked them to repent and believe in him. It's kind of funny in the writings of um, Josephus Flavius, the ancient Jewish historian. There's this story where Josephus has left Judaism and the nationalism of Judaism and has joined the Roman ranks. And he writes his fellow Jews, you need, oh, it's almost verbatim, you need to repent and believe in me. And what is Josephus saying? You need to change your mind. There's no way you're going to take on the Roman legions and win. You need to change your mind and become a collaborator like me and follow the way I'm going. Jesus is saying the same thing. You need to repent, change your direction, believe in me and follow the way I'm going and how to be Israel in the world. And of course, that is a word from God to every one of our hearts. You need to repent, change your direction and follow Jesus. That is a word to each one of us. Jesus drives this nail home and the story we have today is really a parabolic story about this text that's spoken earlier by Jesus and Matthew. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, 
will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy? That's a religious function, religious act. In your name, and in your dr name drive out demons? Religious. And in your name perform many miracles? Religious. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Those are some pretty strong words. They're words that should humble us thinking about our own spirituality, our own prayer life, our own life of reflection. Notice, I never knew you. This is about relationship. This is about intimacy. This is about honesty with God and ourselves. Often painful honesty. I never knew you. And that's where this text leads us. Now, I have four short queries for us to think about. Every one of us in this room needs to answer the question for ourselves, what is the source of Jesus' authority? Is He really the Son of God? Is He more than just a good ethical teacher or someone I read in a footnote? Is He the Son of God? Is He the living Christ? And if that's the case then we have things to change about ourselves and ways that we approach God because often we approach God and we're good at this as Quakers really we approach God from our heads but look at this I never knew you this is about the heart. This is about truth and honesty and intimacy. What source is the authority of Jesus? The second question is, are you responding obediently following the ethics, morality, and teachings of Jesus? Or are there parts of your heart where you're playing games and giving lip service to God? You know, one of the things that just drives me crazy, and I don't know if this is true for you guys, but I go out into the world and meet all these people that call themselves Christians, and they're doing all kinds of unethical things. I mean, blatantly. <laughs> it's not even hidden. And I go, wow, really? But what about me? Where, what is it inside of me that needs to be changed? I need to repent. Because oftentimes, I think we think we're going to work in the God's vineyard, and all we're doing is moving the stones along the path instead of actually working in the vineyard. Third, what should we be doing today that would challenge the power brokers of this present world, which would make other people ask, by what authority are you doing these things? That is a good question. And something to think deeply about in our country that is being ripped apart by racism, ageism, sexism. We need to be doing things prophetically that are practical that people go, wow, why are you, why are you doing this? Because that's what Jesus did. And fourth... And this should also cause us deep humility. There is something cautionary and something hopeful at about a person's response to God which may not be their final answer. Does that make sense? That's, that's kind of wordy, but this is what I want you to get. 
Remember the people who said no and then ended up in the kingdom? And the people who said yes to the kingdom but really didn't end up in the kingdom? We need to be cautionary about how we view people. Because we may run into people who say no and they may end up being the greatest preacher in our time right out of our, our community. They may, may become one of the greatest servants of Christ. We don't know. We shouldn't give up on people. And so this text calls us to humility about other people, about how we view them. Oh man, they're great. Really? Are they going to end up great? Oh, they're immoral, they're alcoholics, they've got deep problems, they're emotionally unstable. But you don't know where the final answer is going to be. You don't know how they're going to, their journey with God. And so we need to think deeply about these things. One of the greatest temptations in the spiritual life, and believe me, I know it, because without you even realizing it, you put pressure on me, is to look good and not be really all that good. And my prayer is that for you and I, is that we are open to the Spirit that we are being changed. We are repenting continually. We're finding new life. We're actually reconciling with people we have problems with because that's what Jesus says to do. We're actually forgiving our enemies because that's what Jesus says to do. And we're actually feeding the poor and caring for the down and out That's because that's what Jesus did instead of paying lip service. That's giving all of who we are in every moment of every day. Because remember, we're just renters. Lucas, we're gonna conclude by singing Jesus Messiah again. We're going to stand and praise the Lord together about this great Lord we serve. I want to give you some information about some people that we care about, that God loves, and that's uh, Louie and Shirley Harrell. Louie has been moved to Hanson Family Hospital. He'll be there, I think, till tomorrow, and then he'll be, he'll be transported to Valley View, which means the esophageal cancer is, has progressed and moving along now. He'll be going into hospice. So please pray for Louie and Shirley especially. I know many of you know them and love them. They're dear Christian brothers and sisters. Hold them in the light in this difficult time. And Dave and Peg and the rest of the family. Um, anyone else that we want to just mention quickly about praying for them? Austin Hutchins is, is being deployed overseas. He's from Eldora, was in Jonathan's class, and he came to worship here for a while after her, her husband died unexpectedly. And I know many of you know uh, Denise and that family. And friends, we've, we, we have to continue to pray for our nation, for hearts. We have to pray for the world right now. And you know what I'm talking about. We have to pray for the world. Let's stand together. Let's sing with Lucas, Jesus Messiah. Sure, I'll give it another shot. <laughs> you did great. He became sin. He became sin. Who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness? Yes, my
Messiah. Name above all names. Blessed Redeemer. Emmanuel. The rescue for sinners. The ransom from heaven. Jesus Messiah. That's what we pray, that you be Lord of all that's within us. Amen.